but um, I'm Sam Chang. I'm the Associate Director for Conservation Evidence at the Center for Biodiversity Outcomes at, uh, here at ASU. Um, and so today I wanted to talk to you guys a bit about sort of how we find the type of information we need to make decisions for different types of conservation systems. So a bit of background, I work in the conservation and development space, so I have both training in, conservation, in uh, natural sciences and in social sciences. And so a lot of the work I do is helping different groups figure out you know, if we want to make the best informed decisions for this particular outcome or this particular context, how do we do it? Where do we find that information? Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about some uh, work we've done in applying machine learning to this and sort of what are the problems and um, benefits of taking this kind of approach. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about this already, but we have this ability now to collect a lot of information about you know, the natural world, we can monitor and assess it. And what's happened is we have a lot of data. So, you know, we can do remote sensing with all these satellites, we can do camera trapping, um, and we put together these giant repositories of information, which allows us to feed into sort of the growth of scientific publication. Um, you know, studies that have looked at this have found that, you know, the, the scientific output of the world is doubling every nine years. So we have thousands upon thousands upon millions of scientific research um, sort of points that we can draw from to gain insight about how we should be making decisions um, about natural ecosystems. So thus, there's an opportunity, right? So we have a giant pile of information. Um, and this is particularly useful because the types of decisions that we're making, sorry, there's like a a buzz. A buzz. I'll try to talk over the buzz. So the kinds of decisions that we are trying to make, especially in the context of these big global challenges, require us to integrate information across multiple different sources about multiple different things. So we need to integrate social science, we need to integrate physical sciences, politics, natural sciences, in order to, for us to be able to track progress towards these goals, right? Um, so despite that desire to conduct ourselves in a way that is evidence informed or evidence based, there's still a considerable gap between the science that's generated and the way that decisions are being made. And so this study is kind of old, but it still speaks to sort of the, the barriers that exist for practitioners and implementers and policymakers to actually access and use information. So the desire is not necessarily not there. It's the fact that there isn't necessarily a support framework that allows them to quickly sort through and evaluate that evidence so that when it comes up, down to it, a lot of decisions are primarily based on experience versus on sort of what does the scientific evidence, the breadth of evidence tell us. Which perpetuates this problem. I really love this article. Um, that it, So this came about when uh, the World Bank released a report that of the thousands of reports that they release every year, no one actually reads them. So they go into this repository and they track them, and they found that a third of the reports had never been downloaded since they've been uploaded to that repository. So the Washington Post are posited, like, could the solution to all of our problems be actually a PDF that no one's ever gonna read because it's hanging out in some you know, journal or in some repository. And so what we're sort of seeing then, there's this need to access research insights, both from the academic literature and from great literature, so unpublished reports um, and evaluations, et cetera, in order to pursue this ideal of evidence-based decision-making. Um, and so to do this, researchers then would need to create a framework um, to actually create those resources for in a support system to be able to access information in a way that's intuitive. So how do we actually go from the giant pile to that, right? Um, so one of the ways that folks have been doing this, and this has been going on for decades now, that originated from the medical sector, is by doing, taking an approach called systematic evidence synthesis. And this is a way for practitioners and scientists to define a common question, typically around the lines of what is the effect of X on Y, or the impact of X on multiple Ys, um, and integrate those, the information from different evidence streams, whether they're studies on people, on humans, on processes, this is coming from the medical sector, um, and look at what works, under what conditions, um, and what are sort of the caveats and limitations and identifying where do we have knowledge gaps. So then we can come to the conclusion of, based on an assessment of the global literature on this topic, we know that this type of treatment is effective for these types of diseases, for example. 
And so that's become a standard of practice for the medical sector. Um, more recently, in the past decade, there's been an effort to expand this to the environmental sector. So can we apply the same type of approach to know what works and what doesn't work for different types of environmental health issues? Um, so there's something called the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, of which I'm a member. And you know, one, it's a standard setting community for doing this, and it also helps publish these types of reviews and these types of maps um, on this information. While that's all exciting, and it's exciting to see that people are interested in, in looking at the breadth of evidence for decision making, there are problems. Um, first, how do you actually do that, right? So how many papers are out there? Going back to that figure I showed, <clears throat> where you know the global scientific output is doubling every nine years. How do you actually crawl through all that information? Um, so there are a lot of tools out there that help you do that. Um, so some are web-based, um, some are sort of frameworks for people to organize themselves and their searching. Um, but not everyone uses them. Some people do things like this, where they organize their data about what they pulled out in these spreadsheets. Um, and this, admittedly, is a spreadsheet that I made. Um, so I am guilty of this as well, um, which makes it really hard for people who are interested in using that information to actually interrogate this. Like, what do these codes mean? You know, what, where did you get this information? You know, what wire lines do you pay, et cetera, and what happens when you break one? Um, and then the third problem is that this is actually very labor intensive. So we, this is information from a study we conducted a couple years ago. Um, that looked at what are the what are the links between nature-based conservation writ large on human well-being. So quite a large question, and our initial search turned up 35,000 potentially relevant hits just from the academic literature. So what do we do? Two of us who had full-time jobs, not doing this, went through. We read all of them by hand. It took us about five months of reading this. We whittled it down to 3,000 articles, which then we had to read all the articles to come down to this 1,000 included articles that were documenting some sort of linkage between conservation and well being. And we're not the only ones doing it. So when we look at uh, systematic evidence syntheses that have been published in the environmental field, people are turning up lots of results. And it's taking them a lot of effort to narrow it down to very, very few included ones. So on average, only about 2% of total articles that people read through were actually included in their final analyses. So it's quite inefficient, this process. And that's also really costly. Um, so you know, what are the resources we need to do this type of work? We need access to peer-reviewed literature databases, which typically come through some type of um, academic uh, or institutional affiliation, but also people's time. So you know, the cost of these can go from anywhere between $30,000 to up to $300,000 and take quite some time. And so this is quite an quite issue when it comes to trying to answer questions at a very short policy window. So say, you know, Eric was talking about this morning, you know, they this bill is coming up onto, um, onto the ballot in three months. We wanna know what are our options? What evidence do we have that these, all, these different types of scenarios are likely or not likely? If we wanted to take the systematic approach, we wouldn't know that apparently for three years, up, well, up to three years, depending on how many resources were available to actually do it, how complex that question was. So this led us to this uh, question of, can we actually use technology to help us do this? So one of the mandates of the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence is that all of these synthesis have to be dynamic, because otherwise they just represent what was our state of knowledge at that point in time. Um, so the mandate is to update them every three years. It took us pretty much three years to do that. So the minute we finished, we are like, oh no, do we need to do this again? <laughs> How do we actually do this? And so we started thinking about, what are, are there options with artificial intelligence? help us smart sort through this? Can we automate this process in some way? Um, and so our thought was maybe we could increase the, the speed at which we're doing this and also make it more efficient. And so what you know ended up happening, so this is work that came out of a Science for Nature and People Partnership a Working Group on uh, Evidence-Based Conservation, of which I was a part. Um, and so it was a collaboration between that group, Conservation International, and with Datakind, which is a data science, uh, data science for social good nonprofit. And so we end up building this machine learning application called Colander. Um, so it's open access, it's open source. Um, and it's what it essentially tries to do is help users find the evidence they want faster by intelligently sorting that information based on user needs. But, you know, what are the risks in applying artificial intelligence to these questions? Um, you know, one, the vast 
value of doing systematic reviews is that the methodology is transparent and it's intended to be unbiased. It's an assessment of what we know and what it tells us about the impact of economic biases. But you know, we know that from looking at the history of systematic reviews in medical literature, that oftentimes these processes aren't as transparent as we want them to be, um, depending on who's involved what sort of values they're proposing onto that question, and where they look for that information. So you often get reviews that are a bit cherry-picked. And so having that sort of black box process isn't really going to be the solution. So by applying artificial intelligence, we knew it had to be transparent in some way to ensure that users would actually believe the information that they were getting out of it. They're going to trust the outputs um, of what this app uh, helped produce. Um, you know, one of the ways, and I'll gloss over this really quickly, one of the ways to try and increase transparency is by registering the protocol, the methods by which you conduct your reviews on things like Sparrow, um, which is a step in the right direction, but you know, what we really, we were finding we needed to design in this uh, machine learning app was more of like the robot that helps you carry your groceries to the car. So you know exactly what you're putting in that robot, and you know where it's going, and less of a Terminator type of thing <laughs> where they're running everything. <laughs> Um, and so what Collender does is it's a semi-automated two-system approach. And so the first stage of this approach, and this is a little bit small, but you can see this better here. So the first stage is once you've downloaded all that information, right? So you've trawled the evidence, uh, the uh, peer-reviewed literature databases, you've trawled the great literature, and you have your pile. So now how do you sort through your pile to find sort of the, the needles in the haystack, so to speak? Um, so what Collender helps you do is that it has you go through your citations and you tell it, this is relevant to me, this is not relevant to me. And then after every 10 articles, it informs the machine learning model um, that's called words to vec. So it basically vectorizes your sentences and looks at the arrangement of your keywords and other words within that sentence and figures out what arrangement of sentences are most relevant to you. And then it re-ranks your list of citations and pushes things that are more relevant to what you seem to be looking for to the top. So as you keep informing the model by saying what's relevant, what's not relevant, more of your relevant searches should come to the top. So it's not telling you what is relevant, it's suggesting, hey, you might want to look at this, and then you can decide whether or not you want to keep it, so keeping that transparency in there. And then the second system is once you've actually gone through and you've gotten your list of things that might be potentially relevant to you. And so now you have to go through the onerous task of actually reading these papers. Uh, reading this literature and gleaning the insights um, from them. And so what the system does is it doesn't necessarily tell you, again, you know, what this paper is about and, and sort of bin it as something that you uh, then have to go back and check. But it suggests different labels. So for example, if you want to go through a set of information and say, I'm interested in, in categorizing all the different types of conservation interventions that are being discussed, it would suggest a series of labels to you based on training data that you provided. So as you go through and you say, this paper is about governance, this paper is about protected areas, it will learn, again, through a supervised learning model that looks at the arrangements of words and sentences based on English language, it will suggest possible labels based and then with a ranked level of confidence. And so this is quite exciting. And so was this the solution to our problems? Is this gonna solve you know, systematic reviewing, is it gonna make everyone do systematic reviews and it'll be cheaper and faster? And, and no, because there are still issues that abound that we cannot address just by using machine learning. The first is if we put in garbage data, as my husband likes to say, garbage in, garbage out, with coding, if you put in bad data, you are not going to get good data back out of it. So you know, one of the things that our, our developers are trying to realize, some things that you indicated were included are just not showing up. And we looked at it, we're like, well, this is a terribly written abstract, that's why. Or things that we didn't include in the end kept showing up and saying, no, you really want this, you really want this. And what happened in the end is that people write abstracts in ways that ensure that they show up first in search results. They mm. use really exciting keywords, they talk about things in sort of vague ways that make it sound like it might be something you're interested in. Um, so one of the first things that needs to be addressed in order for machine learning to really help us is train people to write better abstracts, or for journals to enforce better guidelines around abstracts. Um, and the second, and possibly greater problem, is that there's a lot of chaos in terms of semantics. Um, you know, when we think about semantics, 
oftentimes we can think about it in ways that sort of like, what are the homonyms, right, that we're talking about? So what word means one thing for someone and what word means something for another? Um, and what the issue is with biodiversity conservation is it's extraordinarily non-standardized. Um, this is just a word cloud that uh, a postdoc is working for me um, on uh, community engagement and conservation put together. Basically, all, here are all the ways that people talk about community engagement. And how are these terms related to each other? How are they different? Are they the same? Do people use them in standardized ways? It's very unclear. So it makes it really difficult for people to really understand you know, what is this paper talking about or to find information they want because they don't know what it might be called. Um, and you know, part of that is because conservation science is an evolving field. You know, this is a paper from 2012 from Peter Kariba defining the new conservation science that is extraordinarily interdisciplinary. And so all these different fields are going to come at it with different theories um, and different assessments and different ways of talking about things. And so if we really want to get to the point where we can apply machine learning, you know, we, we have to recognize that conservation is constantly evolving and that there, people are making up new terms. And we need better ideas of how to connect these terms to each other as sort of a semantic hierarchy about what means what. And so, you know, the medical field has done this well, yet again, we're going back to medicine, but they've created standard lexicons about how words are related to each other. So if we're talking about viruses, influenza is a virus, but not all viruses are influenza, for example. And so how do you tag articles using a standard lexicon, using a standard terminology so that people find things or are looking for things? With one term, they might find that these other things pop up because they are related, you know, and who decides what's related to what. Um, so really, this is it doesn't really end with any um, grand, I guess, um, solution. But if we want to use machine learning, if we want to use this type of artificial intelligence, we really need to standardize our apologies or have the conversations about that. So there are existing efforts within conservation. IUCN's really been leading this. Um, in trying to create a standard lexicon for conservation. The problem is, is that one, the people who are creating it aren't necessarily reflective of all the fields of conservation. And the second is that no one's really using it. Um, so I think it's a, definitely a conversation that needs to happen. Um, but yeah, that is it.